Um, we talked about uh, the gauge gravity duality or the quantum field theory and gravity duality. We said we had some gravitational system in the interior that is the same as a field theory, a quantum field theory on the boundary. Okay? This is true in any number of dimensions and so on. And it's expected to be true uh, quite generally. So it's expected that any quantum field theory should be equal to some uh, quantum gravity theory. Now, in general, this is a very abstract statement. So it uh, makes a little more sense when we have a quantum field theory when the number of, of fields is very large. And in that case, the gravity theory is not so quantum. It's a kind of uh, semi-classical gravity theory. Um, and then if we further assume that the interactions are strong, so we have a quantum field theory with a large number of degrees of freedom and also strongly coupled. OK, so now we have this. Uh, then uh, this is supposed to be the same as an Einstein gravity theory. Now, for most of you in the audience, you probably only think of this type of uh, theory as a, as a gravity theory. So a theory where you have the Einstein equations, uh, space-time, dynamical space-time, and so on. So these cases are the ones, the, the duals of those theories, so the boundary duals of those theories, are quantum field theories, which have a large number of degrees of freedom and are strongly interacting. Okay. Um, now, we uh, people who think about quantum gravity sometimes consider other uh, gravity theories a little more generalized and so on, but for, let's say, your purposes and for the usual applications that uh, people talk about, uh, it's important only to consider uh, this uh, type of duality, okay? This limit of the duality, the limit when you have a large number of degrees of freedom, you have strong coupling. Yes? Is it accurate to say that it's really equal to that, or is it really just equal to the boundary of the gravity? Right, so uh, the conjecture is that this is an equality, right? It's an equality in all cases, right? And um, the, you can ask, uh, what evidence, or could it really be true? And uh, we have a lot of evidence that this version is true. This version is also true. Um, there is less. Ev there is, I would say, no evidence that this one is true because we don't have an independent definition of the right-hand side. Um, <laughs> but <laughs> because what we understand, uh, our current understanding of gravity, let's say through string theory, is through this semi-classical expansion, where you expand to uh, order or order in you expand perturbatively in the coupling constant, which is the 1 over n expansion. And, um, but yeah, so we, we have no reason to think that, well, this, is, this, this side is to be defined. So, um, but in, uh, in these cases, we can actually uh, do calculations and check. So most, most of what has been done are checks that things work. Uh, Okay, so I tried to give a, a discussion of why uh, you need strong coupling last time, but uh, from the questions I felt it wasn't very clear. So rather than continuing along these lines, I would like, like now to give some uh, examples of, um, of ways to use this relationship. So examples of how to do some concrete calculations. Okay, and so hopefully things will become a little more clear. Um, so the first example is the uh, computation of uh, correlation functions of operators. So we imagine uh, we have um, the some direction x in the field theory, and we consider a local operator at one point, let's call it x1, and a local operator at some other point, x2. Okay? And what we're interested in is computing the correlation function of uh, these two operators. Okay? So the system here is a quantum field theory. So in condensed matter language could be a quantum critical point, or that would be a scale invariant one. Um, and that's what we are trying to compute. Um, and these uh, correlation functions of local operators, 
And these operators can be chosen so that they have definite scaling dimensions, so that when we rescale all coordinates, they behave in a simple way, so the operators have certain sc scaling exponents or anomalous dim or dimensions. And by just scaling, this uh, two-point function should go like the distance between these two points, so x12 to the power 2 delta. Okay? And where delta is the scaling exponent of this operator. So in a specific theory, these operators will have a specific scaling exponent, and they depend on the theory you have. So for example, if you have the theory describing the Wilson-Fisher fixed point that describes the um, uh, liquid vapor critical point in water, for example, you will have specific uh, critical points that you can calculate in various ways. Okay? you'll have a specific scaling exponents that you can calculate. And they, for a given theory, you will have a f different operators you could consider, and each will have its own critical expon exponents. So those are calculations you do in the quantum field theory, and if you know your quantum field theory, you can do those calculations. And in particular, the calculation of the critical exponents is a non-trivial calculation you need to do. Um, Okay, now uh, imagine your field theory has a gravity dual, so there will be, um, so now we have the x direction we had before, but now, well maybe I'll draw it also here. Um, now we have also a c direction, which uh, goes down, and it turns out that the prescription for computing uh, this two-point function is that whenever there is an operator, this operator inserts a particle into the bulk. So there's a particle that ends at that point on the boundary, and another particle, well, or the same particle, that ends at this other point in the boundary. So, um, so we consider uh, here is a space-like trajectory um, for a particle um, that emanates from this point and ends on that other point. And out of, of, of all possible trajectories, we consider the one that uh, has minimal length, um, and that will be uh, yeah. So from the bulk point of view, um, that uh, will be the case if we consider a particle of large mass. So if we consider a very massive particle uh, propagating, uh, then this uh, very massive particle will have a, a definite uh, classical trajectory, and which uh, will follow a geodesic. Okay? Now geodesics in uh, hyperbolic space, uh, so this calculation has is been done now in uh, hyperbolic space. We, we are, I'm taking time Euclidean or not considering the time direction. Uh, so we are considering the equal time correlator, for example. Um, and then the calculation is effectively in hyperbolic space. And uh, geodesics in hyperbolic space are uh, semicircles that end on the boundary. Or they could be straight lines that emanate from the boundary. But that, so you can, you can check that geodesics in this space uh, are semicircles. Um, um, but um, Okay, or maybe you've already uh, seen that. If you've seen any picture of uh, hyperbolic space, like those Escher pictures, uh, maybe you uh, might have seen, you've seen they, they have all these little circles going to the boundary and so on. So all, all these are geodesics. Um, and um, so um, in order to, then in order to calculate, the prescription is that in order to calculate this, what we need to, uh, to do is to um, evaluate the length uh, so this calculation is supposed to be equal to the propagator of this particle, which is e to the minus the mass times the length uh, of that geodesic. Okay. Now, what is the length? Well, let me first uh, define this a little more precisely. So there is a parameter here, which is the radius of ADLs, um, the overall radius. So here we wrote it with radius 1, and then there is an overall scale. And so. Um, this length will be e to the minus m times the radius of ADS times the length in uh, the length according to this metric. Okay. And the length according to this metric will be some integral dc, uh, well, the square root of dc squared plus dx squared uh, divided by c. So the, the top part is just the usual uh, Euclidean metric for a circle, right? And we are dividing by this coordinate c. Um, and in principle, so we uh, integrate from zero to, to let's say, uh, so if these are separated by some distance uh, 
L, so this distance here will be L over 2, and we'll have to do this integral. Now, this integral will be infinite because near set equal to zero will have a divergence. Because notice this uh, geodesic here is essentially perpendicular to the, to the boundary, and we had mentioned last time that the distance to the boundary is actually infinite. So we'll get the divergence, which is a logarithmic divergence. So we can cut this off at some distance epsilon from the boundary, and after uh, we do that, we'll get that this will be log of uh, the distance between the these two points divided by epsilon. Okay? So that will be the result of uh, doing this integral. So it has a logarithmic divergence, ultraviolet divergence, and the infrared cutoff comes from the actual distance between uh, these two, the distance on the boundary. So th this L is not the distance in the curved space metric, but the distance in the flat space metric. Right? So here, this L that I'm talking about here is just the ordinary distance between 1 and 2. Um, so, okay, so we uh, put this in, and what we get is that this calculation, so this two point function, so calculated via gravity, so this is an equality that continues here, uh, is e to the minus m radius of ADS um, times uh, this length, which is the log. Uh, so, if we do it carefully, there is a factor of 2 here. Um, log of L over epsilon. You can do as an exercise uh, the calculation of the length of this geodesic that I described here. Um, and this ends up giving um, epsilon over L to the 2 delta. Okay? And L, I, we said, was x12. Okay? So we see that uh, it has essentially the same, the same dependence on x. And this epsilon is a, is a constant. So some extra constant appears here. And you'll always have this constant whenever you do this computation in a quantum field theory. It comes from, um, 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 it's a multiplicative constant that you'll always have to introduce when you renormalize these operators. So the process of renormalization in the field theory, um, if you did it, let's say, starting from a lattice regularization, you will also have to introduce this, uh, this uh, UV dependence, dependent or lattice spacing constants. Uh, that multiply each of the operators. Okay. So that is uh, not surprising we got this, and it corresponds to the renormalization of the operators in the quantum field theory. In the gravity side, it comes from uh, an infrared diversion. So it comes from the fact that the distance is very long. So what is a short distance effect in the gravity theory, in the, what is a short distance effect in the quantum field theory, corresponds to a long distance effect or something very close to the boundary in the uh, in the gravity side. And these constants are, that, I mean, this constant that appears here is a, you get a diversion constant for each uh, operator, which is independent of the distance between the operators. So it's a constant associated to each of the operators. If you are doing a three point function, you will get three factors, one per operator, and you can always remove them. Now, any calculation that you do in, uh, in ADS typically will give you something infinite for this reason, because you are sitting very far away and there is an infinite distance, you'll get these infinities, and they are the same infinities that you get in a quantum field theory, in a continuum quantum field theory. And you are not interested in these uh, infinities, they are all local, they only depend on, uh, they are just constants, they don't depend on the distance between the operators, um, and you remove them. So there is a well-defined procedure to remove them, it's the procedure of uh, renormalization in the field theory, which here becomes uh, rather simple uh, and geometric. Yes. Yeah, yeah, so epsilon is, uh, yeah, it's up, up to where we went uh, here, right? And we took it to be constant. Now, I think the question you're asking is, if I chose a cutoff epsilon which depends on x, then what would I have found? And what we would have found here is that instead of this, we would get epsilon at x1 to the delta and epsilon at x2 to the delta. Okay, that uh, would be the result if we had done what you are suggesting. And this is, uh, so here we see that this epsilon is the local value of epsilon, of the cutoff at the, at the insertion of this operator, as we expect. Okay, so that's an example of a calculation. Um, now we can, uh, in the same way, we can compute, let's say, uh, three point functions. Ah, one thing I didn't mention 
was, oh sorry, I should have emphasized this, that um, delta is equal to m times radius of ADS. So the constant delta, which is the anomalous dimension of the operator, is related to the mass of the particle in, in ADS, right? And this calculation, we said, was valid when uh, this anomalous dimension is, uh, is big. So what it means is that the Compton wavelength of the particle is bigger than the size of ADS. Uh, yeah, that's the prescription. I know I, I didn't I didn't explain it. Yeah. So um, so I'm giving an example of a translation between a calculation you do in the quantum field theory and a calculation you do uh, in gravity. And I say I, I just said prescription. The prescription is the following. Is this one? Um, I haven't motivated. I'll probably motivate a little more later. But I, I want the thing is that the final answer is simpler than the motivation. So I, I, at least I'll uh, try to explain what the final answer is. At least the final answer is not lost in the, <laughs> in, in the motivation. Uh, and um, uh, in the same way, you can compute three-point functions, for example. So now you have to consider uh, three particles that interact in the bulk and go to three different points. And you could calculate the three-point functions. Right? So that's, uh, those are other things you can do. Now, in, in many applications, we are really going to be interested in uh, operators with conformal dimension, which is uh, lower. Uh, and uh, for example, we could consider the stress tensor operator or a current, we have, which have dimensions of order one or the other dimension of the space. right? Um, so let's say two or three, depending on the dimension of your space. So we'll have dimensions, let's say two, three, four, etc. Um, and for those, it's not uh, enough to use this uh, geodesic approximation. So because the, um, when this is of order one, so let's say it's of order three or of order one, then um, the um, Compton wavelength of the particle is comparable to the size of ADS. We need to, 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 to be, a little, be a little more sophisticated. Um, and the, the, the slightly more sophisticated prescription is to say that uh, we don't just consider the classical geodesic, but we consider the path integral over all possible uh, paths that go between these two points. Okay? So you can think of this as taking into account the quantum mechanics of the particle. So when, uh, when the particle is not too massive, then the particle doesn't behave you know, classically, but you need to take into account the, account the quantum fluctuations of the particle itself. We are not uh, changing the background, so the background is totally fixed. But the particle is now a quantum particle. And the sum of all paths sounds like something very scary that you need to do. But of course, it's just ordinary quantum mechanics. And in ordinary quantum mechanics, the sum of all paths is done by uh, solving the wave equation, right? Uh, the wave equation for this particle. And so if we have a massive particle, we'll have a Klein-Gordon uh, wave equation. Um, and um, so in Solving this wave equation with appropriate boundary conditions here uh, amounts to doing this path integral over all, uh, over all these paths. Okay? So that's, um, that's uh, the a more concrete prescription. And if you do that, then you find that this formula gets changed slightly. So delta <coughs> is equal to the dimension of uh, the boundary theory. Uh, I'm just, uh, I'm not deriving the formula, I'm just uh, giving you the final answer that comes from solving that wave equation. Um, and so now this formula is uh, actually exact in, in M. And um, so then it, it, what this is saying is that if you have a field of some mass M uh, in ADS, it, the anomalous dimension of the corresponding operator in the boundary is given by this formula. Okay? And we got this formula by, uh, well, I, I didn't explain how to get this formula, but you can get this formula by solving the wave equation here in ADS. Um, in particular, by seeing how the solutions of this wave equation behave for small c. So for small c, the solutions to uh, this wave equation um, behave like c to the delta and c to the d minus delta. So, well, let me say. And 
uh, where delta is that quantity. So you get this by simply calculating the two indices. So you take this wave equation and you calculate the small c behavior. In order to calculate that, you typically have to solve the quadrat. You postulate the c to some power. You solve for the two. You get the quadratic equation for the power. And then uh, there are two solutions which are uh, given in terms of delta in that way. And you can see here at least that uh, if you rescale c, uh, the, phi, the field phi gets rescaled for this particular solution. So this is the one you choose to get to, to give you what the anomalous dimension of the corresponding field is. Um, I'm not explaining all of this. I'm just trying to make it plausible. Okay. Um, yeah. So for the three-point function, do you have three geodesics? Yeah, you, have, you would have three geodesics that meet at the point. And at this point, let's say the forces on this point have to balance. And that will give you the location of this point in the middle. Right? So it's like uh, having... Uh, some three strings that meet at the point, and they are. These are not strings, these are geodesics, but I'm just <laughs> saying. <laughs> uh, yes. Yeah. Yeah. So when mass times r radius is of the order of one, yes. so does it mean that your this mass itself is back reacting on the space? No, no, no. Here, here we're always working, so in, the, in what I'm discussing here, we're always working in the approximation that um, n is very large. So there is no back reaction on, on the geometry. So what it means is that you have to take into account the quantum mechanics of the particle in the fixed background. Um, and for operators of interest in applications, which are the stress tensor and currents, uh, the particles in the interior are like the graviton. Or, or And for massless particles, this formula is also true. So let's say for a graviton, right? So for graviton, there is a slight modification because the wave equation now, there, there are indices for the graviton, but in the end of the day, the formula is the same for the graviton case. And delta, uh, if you put m equal to zero here, you get that delta is equal to d. So d is the dimension of the boundary theory. So it's the number of dimensions here along the boundary. And that's the scaling dimension of the stress tensor, right? So recall that um, stress energy, so this, is, this has uh, dimensions of energy density, right? Energy has dimension one, and density divided by, you multiply, uh, you sum d minus one. Right? One plus d minus one, uh, so it gives dimension d, okay? Yeah. Question. I was a little confused about the location of that point. The, so it seems like if you... Well, it seems like it will push it up, but... Yeah. Yeah, but, but this, this is where uh, things are very tricky, because you have to remember that all this has been done in curved space. So, uh, yeah, and, yeah. So it seems like there is a lot of uh, freedom to choose the, the product M times R. There is a lot of freedom, yeah. So, so in the sense that you can choose R and M independently. Right, but then, yes. then, then this correction seems to be, seems to have some physical consequences for the yeah. QFT. Yeah, so what yeah, yeah. Good, good question. So the, the point is the following. The point is that um, if you, uh, have a particular QFT on the boundary, right? So a particular QFT will have some particular scaling dimensions. It will not be anything. It will be some particular numbers, you know, 2.35, etc. And that will be related to a particular gravity theory, right? Where the masses of the fields that propagate are not also not arbitrary. You have some masses, or sp specific masses, with, uh, um, which are also some numbers, um, some specific numbers. And when you have a concrete example, well, you have to figure out in some way what is the gravity dual and what are these masses. So what I'm saying here is that if for some reason you know what the masses are here on the right-hand side, uh, then you will not be able to calculate what the anomalous dimensions are on this side and, and vice versa. Right? Um, in practice, so for many applications, uh, the operators that are, consi are considered are the stress tensor currents which have protected dimensions. Uh, so, and in the bulk, they correspond to massless fields, like gauge fields, U1 gauge fields, or uh, the metric or the graviton, which are massless. And then, then you are totally fixed by the symmetries in what their dimensions are. Um, uh, yeah. I understand if uh, I mean, this quantum field theory, is mm -hmm. that a general quantum field theory or a theory at a critical point? Yeah, so the, the um, the field theories that have uh, gravity duals um, have to satisfy these conditions that they are, have very large n and have very strong coupling. They don't have to be scale invariant, 
and there are examples where they are not scale invariant. But they are very special because they have this very strong coupling. Um, so, yeah, they don't have to be uh, scale invariant. In this calculation, I used scale invariance, but uh, you could do this in a non scale invariant theory. So, yeah. And how do you decide uh, the corresponding ADS curvature from? Uh, a Good, non yeah, a yeah. Non right. So, what, what is really relevant is uh, this product. and. Uh, but, um, and I, I haven't talked about the quantum corrections, and there you would, we would need the radius of ADS in Planck units. Uh, recall that that was related to a number of fields. Um, that you have to decide once you uh, say what your quantum field theory is. So, so far we've said, we, we assume we have some quantum field theory, and if you give, you give a particular quantum field theory, we'll have a particular gravity dual. Now, this discussion is a little abstract because I'm not telling you what the quantum field theory is. And the quantum field theories that have these gravity duals are very special. And they involve gauge fields and things like this that I, I tried to describe last time. Um, but um, I guess I, I got from the question that perhaps these are not very familiar field theories, or at least described in non familiar language. But um, they, yeah, so these are the quantum field theories you, we are talking about. And, in particular, you should think of this as somewhat special quantum field theories. They are not going to be the quantum field theories you directly are going to encounter in a condensed matter system for two reasons. So one is that in, the, in a typical condensed matter system, the number of fields will not be very large. It will be of order one. And the second is that the interactions might be of order one, which are strong for the condensed matter point of view, uh, but not much, much larger than one that are so strong that you can apply this. So these are two reasons, and that, that, that's why I tried to explain that a little longer. So they, these are special quantum field theories, and you should view them as special, and you should view them as uh, toy models. For probably, for, from the point of view of condensed matter physics, you should view them as toy models where you can test various hypotheses. So if you say, well, I think that uh, certain properties should be true in all quantum field theories, and then you can go and check it in these cases where it's easy to check. Uh, I'll, I'll discuss one such check later. Um, so, um, yeah. Just at a qualitative level, if I use this for a non-conformal field theory? Yeah, so let, let's, let, yeah, so let, let me, yeah. So I just wanted to ask, yeah. it seems like you were using the scaling dimensions yeah. to set the masses of the theory, but now I don't yeah. have scaling dimensions anymore. Yeah, 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 yeah. So let's, uh, let, let's imagine you have a, a field theory which is conformal in the ultraviolet, right? So it goes to, flows to the conformal field theory in the ultraviolet, but it's not conformal. Okay, so uh, you can model that by just simply saying that you have you, you, any theory like that will be of this form with some function f of c here, right, in the metric, extra function, which goes to one for small c, and then it's uh, different than one. Okay. So then, when you calculate this uh, geodesic equation, you will not get the semicircle anymore. You'll get you get something else, which uh, which depends on the particular properties of your function f of c, um, and. In that case, uh, well, this calcul th will not get the same as this calculation. You'll get a more non-trivial function of L as your two-point function. So it won't be a simple power, but it will be a more complicated function of L. The UV diversion part will be exactly the same, because we said this function goes to 1 at C equal to 1. So you'll get these epsilons to the power deltas. And that's, uh, those deltas are the conformal dimensions in the UV. That sets what operator you have in the UV. And then, they, then you'll get a more complicated function of x. Um, OK. Um, so for example, imagine you have a gap theory. So just, just to uh, imagine you have a theory where that has a mass, some mass gap. right? So um, then uh, in those theories, you don't expect that the two-point functions should behave like x to some power, but they should behave like. Uh, like e to the minus uh, capital M uh, times the distance, right? So it's the mass, minimal energy excitation, and then the distance. So that's uh, what you expect. Um, so how can you get something like this? Um, well, you can get something like this if this function f of c is such that, notice that when we go near c equal to 0, the metric along this direction grows, right? And when we go here, the metric uh, shrinks along the x direction. So that's why this geodesic wants to go as fast as possible deep and then move in the x direction when it's, uh, the metric is shorter. Right? 
But if you now make this function so that it uh, grows, uh, again, when you, so, so let's say the function f of, f, f of c has a minimum here, right? And then it starts growing again. So in that situation, the, these geodesics, uh, when you separate them by a long distance, they will want to come down and basically be at this minimal uh, point, minimal point for this overall factor. So that's a minimum of, uh, that's the point where this whole combination is minimum. And the value, then you'll get something which is proportional to this length. So up to the li these little contributions at the two ends which uh, uh, are independent of the distance. Um, you'll get uh, an answer of this form where this m will be uh, the value of this, uh, let me call this uh, warp square. So there will be the warp factor, uh, the, mi the minimum value of the warp factor times the actual uh, mass of the particle. Right? Uh, so you'll get an expression essentially of this form. Um, is that more or less clear? So you, 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 can, get, you can get different answers for, for different theories. Now you can say, well, what sets this, uh, this particular function? Do, is, am, I completely, am I free to choose whatever I want? And the answer is no. You are not free to choose whatever you want. You have to solve the uh, Einstein's, equa Einstein's equations in the bulk, and you have to uh, choose your theory in the bulk in such a way that uh, you develop that work factor. Um, and there are specific examples. But again, if I start talking about the specific examples, they're all of little details that uh, are, are probably relevant. Um, yeah. Is it true that these uh, unique contributions at the end would give kind of a one over, I guess, uh -huh. an m to the two delta three factor on that exponential? Um, so what are you expecting standard scaling theory? Um, yeah, that sounds right. Yeah, it's just the length from, uh, from here to here, which is, uh, yeah, exactly. Yeah, it's just the epsilon over m to the delta, yeah. Um, epsilon, sorry, epsilon times m to the delta. Um, right, so that's, um, that's that. So I'll, I'll now give a slightly more Well, I'm already half an hour into it. Um, well, I think, so there, there is a more general expression for the correlators that uh, I can't resist giving. Uh, so if you have, uh, if you are in the quantum field theory, uh, you can consider the generating functions of correlators of x. So phi here is a function, just an ordinary function. O is an operator. And this is an expectation value in the field theory. Then by taking functional derivatives with respect to phi and setting that to zero, you generate all possible correlation functions, okay? So that's equal to the partition function in the gravity theory, um, um, where you sum over all interiors where the boundary, that's where the, so where the, there is a field phi of uh, x and c corresponding to that operator. And at c equal to zero, this field has the boundary condition that it should be, so this is at c equal to zero. It's equal to that function phi zero, which is arbitrary. In other words, we take uh, our uh, boundary and we put some arbitrary function for the values of the field phi zero of x, which lives here on the boundary. And then we uh, determine the interior values of phi of x and c by uh, solving this wave equation. Um, so so in, in general, so let me, let me say the general prescription. So the general prescription is that you do this. Now, if your theory of gravity contains the scalar um, and the gravitational action for the scalar is just the free action for a scalar field, then an approximation to this quantity would be to say that we calculate the uh, classical action, which is this, uh, evaluated at uh, a classical solution, which is a solution, uh, which is a solution with, it, with this definite boundary values. Okay, so we calculate the solution of this uh, wave equation with these boundary values. We put it in this classical action. We put it here, and that gives us an approximation to this quantity. That gives us the leading order approximation to this quantity. 
Okay, I, hopefully that was clarifying. If, uh, if it wasn't, uh, then we could go back to this other uh, more basic thing. So this, um, this general prescription reduces to this prescription we discussed here when the mass is very large. Okay. Yeah. Yeah, solving the wave equation. Ah, th I, there is one point that uh, might be. So solving for the wave equation here, this uh, what I call here the classical wave equation, is really doing the quantum mechanics from this uh, particle point of view. Right? Why is that? Um, um, why is that? So. Basically, because this, is, this you can view it as a kind of uh, Schrodinger equation, right? I mean, if in the large mass limit, you can... Uh, well, um, let me go more slowly, what's the simplest explanation? Um, so he, here I'm, uh, I'm using the fact that uh, if you have a field propagator, uh, I can represent it as a sum over paths, right? So if you have, let's say, a lattice model, for example, and you can compute in a two-point function, you can... Um, you can think of the sum or, well, for simple lattice, let's say, icing, icing models where you have pluses and minuses, right? You can uh, write this as uh, a sum over all possible paths, right? And, um, and that's, uh, well, true also in continuum field theory, that we can write it as a sum over all possible paths. Um, it's essentially similar to the Feynman story for the path integrals. Um, and, and that's equivalent to solving the, this classical equation, just this simple equation. Uh, right, it's equivalent to doing the sum over paths. Um, it, it's it's the, the the reason is the same as the reason why when you do the functional integrals, then the the let's say the the result of this functional integral obeys uh, the Schrodinger equation, right? So the sum over all paths paths ends up obeying a classical differential equation, which is the Schrodinger equation. Now maybe you could call that the quantum equation, but anyway, I'm. You see that there is yeah, maybe. Maybe the point is this mixture of classical and quantum that I'm making that perhaps I am confusing you. So, um, well, what looks like a quantum particle in the second quantized picture in terms of fields is just classical field theory, essentially solving the classical equation. What we would call more quantum mechanics of the field will be when we start including interactions, like the possibility that particles join and, uh, and split into two, for example, uh, in a process like this. Um, is that the point that was causing difficulty, perhaps? Yeah. Yeah. Mm -hmm. No, it's not the same. So phi zero of x. Uh, we could call it f of x, right? This is the boundary condition for the field in the bulk, right? Yeah. So f of x is the boundary condition for the field in the bulk. Um, now, I think this prescription, so you asked me before about the motivation for this prescription. So it, it is a little more clear to motivate this if, uh, if the field, we are, if the operator we consider is the, the stress tensor and the field uh, we consider is the metric, right? So this is a deviation from the flat space metric. Because what is this? So the left-hand side is putting the field theory in an arbitrary curve background, right? And what we are saying is that that arbitrary curve background is actually the, the boundary value of the metric uh, that appears here in the interior. Okay, that sounds a little, well, perhaps it's a little more reasonable. Uh, because there is some metric on the field theory, and well, that's the same metric that appears uh, far away on the boundary. So um, if instead of considering uh, this metric, I, we, we were to consider a metric where here we have a more general um, uh, boundary metric, right, g mu nu of x. So this would be the behavior near c equal to zero. Then in order to find the behavior everywhere else, we would have to really solve it, and this would become a function of x and c, right? Um, yeah, so, but the metric on which the filter is defined is this, the, the metric at the large values of C, okay. Uh, does that make it a little more clear? But the yeah. operator does not appear anywhere on the right hand side. No, 
on the right-hand side, what we have is, uh, well, I, I'm defining this as a functional integral with boundary values. Uh, no, we, we don't have an operator that is acting on some Hilbert space. There are, there are other ways of defining this where there are actually operators. But, uh, yeah. So there is an alternative, well, maybe I, I won't. Let, let me just say that there is an alternative way of defining the right-hand side where there are actually operators acting on the bulk. It's basically there is an operator phi acting on the bulk. Um, and then uh, the left-hand side corresponds to taking this, um, these operators very near the boundary. Uh, I prefer this way of presenting it because it's uh, also closer to what we do in uh, the sitter space. So it, it applies a little more generally than the other description. Um, um, okay, so I now uh, would like to to mention one other important ingredient that uh, appears in mo most of the applications to uh, condensed matter and also for the interest of this in, uh, from the gravity point of view, which is uh, uh, black holes. Okay. So, so far we've been uh, talking about uh, sort of the boundary and then some interior which is you know, some smooth geometry and so on. Um, but in the interior we could have, so the, the gauge gravity duality says that, um, so all the states that uh, happen, that can exist within this interior, correspond to states that can exist in the quantum field theory. Okay? So, and in particular a state that can exist here in the interior is a black hole. So you can have a black hole inside this uh, curved space. So in the same way that you can have a black hole in flat space, uh, the ordinary Schwarzschild solution, you can have a very similar solution, which is a black hole in this uh, curved space. Okay. And the idea is that uh, these black holes uh, correspond to thermal configurations in the field theory, right? in the quantum field theory. Yeah, so far, far away near the boundary, the solution approach, yeah, let me be more concrete so that uh, this discussion becomes more clear. So, um, let's, uh, I, I'm going to now discuss the simplest uh, black hole configuration, which uh, sometimes called the black brain. Um, so imagine you have a theory which contains a time direction and some number of space directions, so that's the that's the boundary theory, right? And so the ADS theory will, uh, will metric will contain these directions. And, um, uh, and some overall C factor, okay? So that's the metric. So we start with this, and this is supposed to be described, this is the metric that describes the vacuum in the quantum field theory. And you can use it to describe the vacuum and small perturbations from the vacuum. So for example, correlation functions of operators in the vacuum. Right? So what we discussed before uh, of computing geodesics in, um, in ADS and so on, that corresponds to computing uh, inserting operators in the vacuum that do not change the vacuum. Now uh, let's imagine that we take uh, that same theory and we raise it to finite temperature. So, um, so then uh, the black hole so corresponding black hole solution would be a solution which is not this one anymore. Uh, instead, so this is now at finite t, um, we'll have a solution which uh, has the form, uh, um, d is the dimension of the boundary theory. Um, um, which uh, is a black hole solution of uh, this kind. The details are not uh, super important. Um, so the metric is almost uh, the same as the one that we had before. The only difference is the presence of this factor, which is uh, multiplying the radial direction, and also the time dimension. And what is uh, the crucial property here, that the crucial thing is that this is becoming zero at some value of c. So for c very small, so let me, uh, so we had the drawing, let's say we have we have here the boundary directions and the c direction. And initially, this c direction was infinite. And now, uh, for this uh, new geometry, 
we uh, at some value c0, uh, we have a horizon where g0, 0, um, the time component becomes 0. This, this, is a sing this is a coordinate singularity. You can go through choosing different coordinates. You can go through this, uh, this place into the interior. In the interior, there is an actual curvature singularity, but for, for what we are discussing right now, the interior is not important. We are going to look at this black hole from the exterior. Okay? Yes? So I don't get why, why the geometric change all of a sudden just because you raised the temperature. Yeah. Um, yeah, naively, what you would have said is I raise the temperature and I will create some massive particles. So I will have a gas of particles in this uh, curved space that uh, we had before. Right? Now, what, what happens is the following. So it has to do with the. Uh, so why, why uh, So let's talk about the thermo thermodynamics in, in the presence of a gravitational field, right? So let's first start with something simple. Let's think you have a gas in a box, right? So um, if you have particles in a box, here you'll have they are moving. And if you go higher in the box, they are moving more slowly, okay? Because here we have pure kinetic energy, here they have some potential energy. Um, now, that's uh, just the ordinary non-relativistic version. So a local observer, so even though this is in thermal equilibrium, a local observer here sees these particles moving faster and these particles moving slower. Okay. Now, if you're in a constant gravitational field, uh, in a gravitational field where this is some function of C, and you're in thermal equilibrium, um, then uh, the measured as an observer who sits at fixed value of C, Right? The local temperature he measures is higher. Well, it's, it, it, the local measure, temperature he measures depends on C. Right? Um, and it depends in the same way that here, if you uh, only look at the velocity of the motion, motion of these particles, it's higher here than here. This is called the Tolman effect. It's important in stars and so on. Um, so the properly thermodynamically def defined temperature is the, measure, the temperature measured with respect to this uh, time. But the proper time is related to uh, coordinate time by this factor. And that factor makes, um, if this becomes small, the, yeah, so let, let's do it uh, more slowly. dt is equal to the square root of g0, 0, dt, right? So temperature is, uh, well, you can view it as the period, if you made time Euclidean, it would be, it would be the period, period of this time, right? Uh, beta. Um, and this is constant, independent of C. And so this is, there is some beta effective, or beta proper, which is the proper size of the thermal circle, which is related by this. So as G0, 0 becomes smaller, this becomes higher, okay? So you put any temperature, right? And let's say you start with this space. You go to large values of C, so you go deep into the interior. G0, 0, which goes like one over C, becomes very, very tiny, right? So if we drew the value of G0, 0, it's becoming very, very small here. That means here you're having very high temperature. You have all kinds of things uh, going on in this space time. And it's so high that it can make a black hole. So in, in gravity, when you put too much stuff, you can, uh, you can produce a black hole. And in fact, uh, you produce a black hole, and at some point, uh, um, well, the, the gravity equations tell you where the horizon should be for a given temperature. And, um, now, what determines, I didn't tell you how to determine the temperature. So, um, this parameter C0 depends on the temperature. And um, you can determine the temperature by going first to Euclidean time. And in Euclidean time, saying that time should be periodic with period beta. And demanding that there is no singularity at C equal to C0. Right? Uh, what that determines is that C0 is equal to some number which depends on the dimension, which I don't remember times beta, okay? So C0 scales like beta. And what this is saying is that um, if you look at this solution in Euclidean time, uh, the, the circle in the time direction, uh, well, is some circle of period beta at infinity. And then the proper size of this circle shrinks, and it shrinks smoothly at uh, C0, okay? So that's a, a bit, that's, this is the diagram, essentially, of the Euclidean black hole. So you have this circle and shrinks to zero at the origin. 
Okay, so that's uh, in more details giving you what the geometries are, what the geometry is. We got this geometry by solving Einstein's equations, uh, with allowing for the possibility of having a black hole. Yeah. I don't quite understand how that makes sense with what you said earlier, because yeah. it seems like you're claiming that the temperature gets higher in there, and that creates a lot of yeah. gravitational stuff, and that in turn back acts on the metric to give you... Yeah, exactly. Sky, but yeah. earlier you were making the argument that we work in a, a fixed metric Yes. And don't worry about the back action. Yes, yes, yes. Yeah. Um, well, we were, we were doing two different calculations. So in the previous case, what we did was we considered the vacuum, and we perturbed very slightly the vacuum at two points to, by the insertion of this operator. So this small perturbation is not enough to cause any changes in the metric. Um, here we're doing something different, which is we are raising the temperature everywhere in space. So that is a big change in the vacuum. And, and, and this is not even limited to this. I mean, raising temperature is a big change in the state of any system. They will look, I mean, um, if, you ten, if you raise the temperature to, to a temperature bigger than the energy gap of your system, the, the state will really change very dramatically. Uh, um, yeah, I mean, we're, we're perhaps we perhaps have too much intuition of uh, weakly coupled theories like, you know, classical electromagnetism, where you raise the temperature and you have a gas of photons, and well, it didn't seem to change too much, but well, some things are pretty different. The uh, correlation lengths are going to be slightly different. And, yeah. So is this temperature same as the temperature you will get if you were to uh, calculate the Hawking radiation? At oh, yes, 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 sorry. I, I should have uh, emphasized that, uh, yeah, this temperature is the same as the Hawking temperature. And this is a quick, so what I described here is a quick way to calculate the Hawking temperature. Yeah. Uh, yeah. So asymptotically, you have that metric and you will yeah. find a Boltzmann distribution. At yeah, so far, yeah, so far away, so if you're sitting here uh, and you're sitting at fixed uh, C, right, you will measure a proper temperature, which is given by the formula I erased, right, that depends on G00. Si since uh, this thing is blowing up, your proper temperature it's going to become smaller and smaller, okay? But um, what we would call the field theory temperature is constant. It's, it's just the period of this time beta. Yeah, ma maybe I'll, I'll try to say this a little. I think this is a detail about curved space that you probably don't care too much about. Well, or, I mean, it's important, but well, for me, yeah, it's important. Um, for the applications, it's not too important. So for applications, the recipe is the following that the temperature appear in the field theory is this time, right? So you make this time periodic, and uh, that's the temperature we're going to have in the field theory, and it's constant. It's just the temperature everywhere, right? We're in thermal equilibrium. So the whole system along the radial direction is in thermal equilibrium. Um, and uh, the, the reason that different observers sitting at different values of C see different uh, local temperatures is uh, it's just the general relativistic effect, which uh, which whose whose manifestation even in in, in ordinary is I mean in, in non-relativistic manifestation is what we said, said that the the molecules at the bottom of a vessel are moving faster than at the top of the vessel. So um, yeah, okay. So I um, okay. So now um, now comes uh, one interesting application, which is. Uh, that we can calculate the thermodynamics of the quantum field theory using this gravity solution. Okay. Um, so um, let's say that we. Well, I'm going to let's say to make the discussion shorter. Perhaps I'm going to assume that you've uh, uh, you've heard about the, the Hawking-Bekenstein formula for black hole entropy, which says that it is the area uh, over of the horizon over 4g newton, right? So this is the entropy uh, in the gravity solution. So if we have a gravity solution of this kind, uh, it's supposed to have a, an entropy associated, which is uh, given by this formula. Um, now, one uh, fun thing to do is to put in the values of h bar and c here. OK. So a peculiar property of this entropy is that it goes to infinity when h bar goes to zero. So it's a quantum effect. And when you make quantum mechanics small, it becomes even bigger. Right? So it's uh, strange in that sense. It's classical in that sense. 
And uh, also, when uh, you make C infinity in the non-relativistic limit, also becomes infinite. Okay, so it's a, it's a very quantum and uh, relativistic effect. Um, but you can, um, well, I, I want, yeah, yeah, I probably shouldn't, I should take this as uh, granted that there is, uh, this entropy is supposed to be associated to these black holes. And it really comes from thinking about the Euclidean gravity solution. So there is this solution in Euclidean space now because I put a plus sign here. You can calculate that, uh, the, the gravitational action of that solution. And you can identify that to uh, minus beta the free energy. Because what are we doing? We are, um, we are taking time to be Euclidean, right? And that's what we would do if we were cal calculating the, the free energy, trace of e to the minus beta h, right? Um, so, and therefore, um, it is natural to say that that gravity solution is the same as, uh, as, as some free energy. And if you calculate the entropy associated to, the, to this free energy defined via the gravity solution, you get this area formula. This was done by Gibbons and Hawking uh, in the 70s. Okay. Um, good, so what, the, what do we get in this particular case? Well, in this particular case, what we get is the following. Um, First of all, uh, we'll get some factors of G Newton and the radius of ADS. So we'll get a G Newton and a radius of ADS uh, to the power um, uh, the, um, well, if this is the dimension of the boundary theory, uh, um, then we get a factor of this kind. Um, and then, um, we will get uh, the action of that particular solution, uh, which will give something in proportion to the volume of the x directions. So this volume of the x directions, there are d minus one of these coordinates, of x, x coordinates. And to make it dimensionless, we should uh, divide by beta to the d minus one, okay? Um, so that's uh, what we get, and then times some number. So this, and then there is some numerical constant, which is uh, some pi's and factors of two and so on, which come from calculating the area. So I, I told you almost everything you need to know to calculate this. You need to calculate the number that comes here. You can do that as an exercise by demanding that the metric is non-singular. Um, and once uh, you know this, you can uh, calculate this number, okay? And recall that yesterday I talked a lot about this combination, and I said that it should be identified with roughly the number of effective uh, degrees of freedom. Okay. Now imagine that we did the same calculation in the in the quantum field theory, right? And in the quantum field theory, um, we could do the same calculation, and let's first do it in the free theory. So in the free theory. In a free quantum field theory, we can easily do this calculation. What are we doing? So we have a, a theory that contains free bosons and fermions, let's say, and we just calculate their entropy at finite temperature. So we have a gas of uh, photons, gluons, and it's more or less the same, and, uh, and we calculate that. And what are we going to get? So, well, we're, we're going to get something that will be proportional to the number of fields, so the number of fields. Um, and then, um, since the system has, so if we are doing this in a scale invariant theory, um, there, well, first of all, there, because we expect the entropy to be extensive, there will be a factor of volume, right? And since the theory is scale invariant, there has to be a factor of beta to the d minus one, right? So in other words, the temperature dependence of the entropy is completely fixed by scaling, okay? There is no freedom. So all that could, we need to calculate is just the, the overall number. So there is the number of the free theory. Um, now, if we make the free theory interacting, this uh, number might change. So, in fact, in this particular case, what you find is the following. So if you do this for a very concrete uh, quantum field theory, which is the... Um, so this discussion might look a little abstract because I'm not uh, telling you what concrete quantum field theory we're using. Well, I, I told you last time what it was, but some quantum field theory. And in that particular quantum field theory, there was a particular coupling constant, uh, which is the, so G squared Yamel's uh, 
n, the number of colors. This was some effective coupling. So if you don't remember what it was, just think of that some, as an effective coupling constant of the quantum field theory. And here I'm going to plot the, uh, the numbers we get, so the free energy, the free energy divided by the free energy of the free theory. So that's one at weak coupling, okay? And at strong coupling, we, uh, which is where the gravity calculation is correct, uh, we get three quarters, okay? Um, so the rest of the dependence on the parameters is the same. So in that, that particular theory, this uh, number of fields is equal to the, the square of the number of colors and so on. Um, and then uh, people computed the first correction here in perturbation theory, and it goes down a little bit. And the first correction uh, coming from string theory, and it goes up a little bit. And we don't know how this curve continues. So this is a particular case where we actually do not know how to continue this curve. But presumably, as you increase the coupling, we can go uh, to the strong coupling answer. And it's a situation where the strong coupling answer is non-trivial. I mean, it's different than the free theory. And you can actually calculate it using uh, the gravity description. And if you were very naive and you thought that the gravity description describes uh, the theory at both weak and strong coupling, you would, be, you would get an incorrect answer. Right? You, might, you might be puzzled. Um, yeah. Yeah, so this is the gra gravity calculation in, 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 the, in the bottom. Yeah, so let me be a little more precise. I don't know why it corresponds to the Yeah, so, so I was saying that that was a free quantum field theory calculation in a free theory. So, so we have, let's say, let, let's say we have a free, uh, free Maxwell field, just for the sake of the argument. We are calculating the entropy in... Uh, the cosmic microwave background, uh, gas of photons at fixed temperature. Right? So first we calculate minus beta f, which is equal to the integral over all possible momenta, right? d3x over 2 pi cubed of log of the uh, 1 minus e to the minus beta times the energy, and the energy is the modulus of k because it's a massless particle. So we calculate this, right? Multiply by a factor of 2 because there are two spin states. And that uh, gives us uh, something. There's a volume factor of space that I forgot to write. But if we calculate this, uh, well, what will we get? By just dimensional analysis, we'll get B3 over beta cubed, right? Times some number that comes from uh, doing this integral, right? That's uh, what I was talking about there. So this number here, this number three comes from just doing this integral. It's, I forget what it is, but maybe it's a set of three or something like a set of two, I don't remember. Um, just that the result of doing this integral. Um, is, is that clear? Or, yeah. Um, and if you had uh, the theory that I talked about yesterday was a theory that contained a bunch of uh, gluons and fermions and bosons. And so in that theory, in the free limit, all you have to do is add the entropies of each of the bosonic and fermionic fields. So bosonic fields uh, will give you this, and there were eight, well, there were eight times n squared bosonic fields. And then the, the, the fermionic fields will give you the same thing with the usual boson, uh, fermionic factor, right? So this is the free energy of a fermion, and again, eight n squared of those fermions. So that's the complete answer for the free theory. So when I said, the one there, the one there came from just doing this integral. Uh, just as simple as this. Um, the, this one here came from uh, the black hole calculation. And, um, and these corrections come from correcting that uh, free answer by taking into account the interactions. So that's this little curve here. You do that uh, using Feynman diagrams and so on, the quantum field theory. So that calculation that I described here comes from Feynman diagrams of this kind, and the corrections come from Feynman diagrams, for example, of this and many others. Uh, okay. Um, very good. Now, I yeah. So, and everything we've said here is the leading order in the uh, one over n expansion. We this entropy that we are talking about. Um, will be, so in general, it's n squared times some function of lambda. 
this, uh, well, let's say there is, of course, the volume over beta cube factor, which is uh, just from conformal symmetry. And then uh, there is a term in general like this, which is what we've been discussing here. And in general, there could also be uh, 1 over n corrections, like n to the 0, so not, not independent of n, and then some other function, f tilde of lambda, and then 1 over n squared times some f uh, double tilde of lambda, and so on. Right? So, so far, I've been talking about this f of lambda, which is uh, supposed to have this form. And then there are these further corrections. Um, so this is all the leading, so this we computed a strong lambda by classical gravity. This would be some quantum gravity corrections we won't care about for, for at all, but at least you should remember. So if you're trying to apply this for n equal to 1, for example, uh, you should be worried that you're not including these things. Um, now I should mention that uh, these parts and some of these parts were actually computed in some uh, numerically for some other systems, some other examples of gauge gravity dualities, where the boundary theory is a quantum mechanical theory. Okay. Now notice that um, if you were trying to compute the entropy here, you would think that it's a very complicated problem because you have to sum up very complicated Feynman diagrams. It's a strongly interacting system. But on the other hand, the gravity description turns that complicated problem into a simpler problem, into a problem of just solving the differential equation. So that uh, has been the, the applications have centered on that fact. Now, before we were computing correlation functions in, in the ADS uh, geometry, but now we could consider, well, let me draw it like this. Uh, but now we could consider it uh, in the black hole geometry. So we have this horizon. And we could, uh, for example, put in the stress tensor. And we have the graviton propagating uh, between these two points. But a new thing can happen, which is that this graviton can fall behind the black hole horizon, right? Um, and these effects, I'm not uh, going to describe the details, um, are related to the following. So we, the, the bla this black hole solution represents a fluid, the thermal uh, density, of thermal gas of, uh, more than gas is more like a liquid, but let's say some thermal configuration. Um, and this calculation of the absorptions of gravitons, absorption of gravitons, corresponds to uh, calculating the shear viscosity of uh, that gas. Okay? And uh, I'm not going to tell you what the details are, but uh, the shear viscosity in units of the entropy density is, turns out to be very simple and have a value which is 1 over 4 pi. If you calculate it, so this is the result using gravity, right? Okay. Now, this is, um, so I, I didn't describe how to calculate this, but it follows from calculating this absorption into the, the black hole and some more general facts about hydrodynamics. Um, so, but it is a simple calculation. It is very simple to calculate, uh, to calculate this. I mean, it is much simpler than calculating it, use it, it in, even in the weakly coupled field theory, it's actually quite tough to calculate the, the shear viscosity because the shear viscosity is actually inf infinite in the free limit. So when you uh, have a very weakly coupled gas, the shear viscosity actually grows um, because it's very, very easy to transfer momentum from one region to the other. Particle can just uh, move across your, your fluid and, and carry a lot of momentum. And, Anyway, and, and it's somewhat subtle to calculate the shear viscosity, but the strong coupling is actually very simple, simpler than in uh, free theories. And you get this result. Now, you might conjecture that this is actually the lowest uh, value for the shear viscosity you could possibly have, and people uh, conjecture this. Um, and these gravity calculations are consistent with this, and the experimental data is also on fluids and so on. It's also consistent with this. But Actually, this conjecture is actually wrong. Uh, uh, so you can violate this by small amounts. So you, you can actually go to more complicated examples of the gauge gravity duality, where you, uh, you, calculate, you, um, you, you calculate some small corrections to this metric that come from, let's say, some stringy effects. And in those cases, you uh, find that the shear viscosity can be lowered a little, more, little bit more than this. 
So this is an example where you can, you know, make some conjecture and then check that it's wrong. And, and, uh, and also, I mean, other people, other condensed matter physicists were uh, suspecting that some bound of this kind might, might be true. Uh, for example, Sashdev had talked about these kinds of bounds. Um, and um, yeah, so currently we don't know what the actual lower bound is. There might actually be a lower bound which is in this neighborhood, uh, but uh, we, we don't know. Um, okay, so since uh, my time is up, maybe I'll finish uh, now and I'll probably concentrate next time talking more about entanglement. Uh, okay, thank you. Yeah, so yeah, the, it's um, it's in this neighborhood. So uh, it's a little bit above the. So so there is only a a lower bound, a bound saying that the viscosity is less than something, uh, and that something is uh, of this order. So the, the results they have are consistent with zero viscosity. So they haven't measured the non-zero value for the viscosity, but. Um, the, so, but, but they can tell that the viscosity is not too high. So, and the lower bound is about a factor of two off from here. Uh, there, there is a bit of a model dependence in how you extract this because they model the hydrodynamics with some assumptions. Um, that fir first, they model the actual collision by hydrodynamics, and then uh, they extract from there the viscosity. But, I mean, the heavy ion collision is not an infinite fluid and that you can very easily separate the long from short distance and so on, so that you have to be careful about that. And I should mention that uh, this, this, this fact uh, shows that it's more like a liquid than a gas. So a gas would have, you know, a uh, much larger value for the viscosity. No more questions, let's uh, have a break and come back at 3.